This is the second video in a series about this Model 15 teletype. In the first video, we provided an introduction and some history about the unit, and then we got to watch it work for the first time. In this video, we're going to go into the details of the data interface used by this to communicate with other devices. As part of that, we're going to look at an interface board I developed to make it easier to interface this old equipment with a modern PC. And we're going to go ahead and demo this as a console with a vintage computer, an Altair 8800 running CPM. That uh, Altair is vintage to us these days, but it was actually 30 to 40 years newer than this teletype was. So that'll be an interesting demonstration. All right, so this teletype commun communicated using a 5-bit code, often referred to as Bado, although technically it wasn't the original Bado code. It was a slightly newer code that was developed uh, to be optimized for teleprinters. Um, that code was transmitted at 45 and a half baud. That comes out to about 22 milliseconds per bit. And when it was sent to the teletypes, it was preceded by a start bit that would actually get the decode process on the teletype working. After the next five bits came in, it then needed about another one and a half bit times, just a hair under, in order to complete the print operation. So it could accept a new character every seven and a half bit times. Multiply that out, you see that's about six characters per second, or it's more commonly referred to as 60 words per minute. Now the machine could go a little bit faster than that, but in the United States, 60 words per minute was the most common uh, usage of this machine. And that's how this particular device is set up as well for 60 words per minute. Now the electrical interface on this for the data, if you come over here and look, you can see the two wires and this red jacket. That is the incoming receive data loop. In the early days, and uh, the first interface and the most common, frankly, was the uh, 60 milliamp current loop, current loop using neutral signaling. A data value of one was represented by the presence of 60 milliamps flowing through this loop, and a data value of zero was represented by the absence of current flowing through that loop. Now, it doesn't say anything about the voltage required, uh, but in the end, voltage was typically running 120 volts DC and higher on these data loops. And the reason for that is because this data loop had to power the selector magnet on this directly. Again, there was no electronics to interface this to provide buffering or amplification. So the data coming in had to drive this selector magnet directly. If you look closely, you can see it right here. These two coils together are wired in series and form one large electromagnet that pulls this armature in or lets it go. And that little bit of motion there is what ends up allowing this machine to decode all the data that comes in. Now these two coils end up being a very large inductor, of course, and the inductor is on the order of four to six Henry's. Not millihenries, not microhenries, but four to six Henry's. And if you recall your physics about inductors, what they do is re resist the change of current. Now, in order to make this reliable, you want this to rapidly get up to 60 milliamps so that the magnet pulls in nice and crispy, crisply. Uh, we have a 22 millisecond bit time. Uh, it would be nice to have that done within, say, 10% of that. So within a couple milliseconds, it would be nice to have it pulled in. In order to get that kind of speed, the voltage across the inductor needs to start up around 120 volts or more. So that's why that high voltage was used, was to get the response time needed. Now, most of the time, this is um, already pulled in after that first two milliseconds, at which point... It only takes about 13 volts to hold the 60 milliamps across this. And in order to limit that current, the high voltage loop had a big resistor in there that limited it to the 60 milliamps. So most of the time, you had well over 100 volts dropping across that resistor down to 13, dissipating 7 to 10 watts of heat. So the interface tended to be a very hot box as far as uh, we'd be consider it today. Now, back in the old days, it was basically pretty much normal, and we'll look at that in just a minute. Now, not only did the sending side generate uh, a waveform that fluctuated between 13 and 120 plus volts, the device itself would end up generating 100 to 200 volt spikes on the line as well. And that is because on the transition from 1 to 0, that inductor has the reverse problem. It does not want to instantly go to zero current. So it builds up as much voltage as it needs to allow that current to continue falling and decay. Now, in order to get a nice crisp one to zero transition, we need to let that voltage build pretty high so that it decays quickly, just like we needed the high voltage to build the current quickly. 
So um, whatever circuit this is in I'll, needs to allow that voltage during the decay process to build up to you know, 100, 200 volts. But we don't want to let it build too high because then it'll eventually start arcing across contacts that might be driving the loop. So typically somewhere on the loop there's going to be um, some capacitor networks or something to keep that voltage from building too high but yet allow it to get up to at least the 100, 200 volt range on discharge. Nowadays we would call that a, a snubber circuit. All right, so looking at all this from the concept of computers, me as a child of the computer age, uh, 5 bit encoding is kind of non standard compared to ASCII. 45 and a half baud is very non standard. 60 milliamps is just a huge amount of current for a, an interface line. Voltage is swinging between 13 and 120 plus volts on transmit and on all transition edges of the data. Is completely unheard of as well. So as a computer person this doesn't seem very workable or standard whatsoever. But back in its days this was completely standard. This is exactly what the telegraph network looked like. This is exactly what the telephone network looked like. And of course that's what the printing data terminals also look like. And that is again because there was no interface electronics to buffer, filter, or amplify signals. So whatever was on the line had to be strong enough to travel down long loops, possibly a mile or more long, and handle the huge voltages required to make these large electromagnetic devices work. So interfacing this is now um, the difficult problem for modern hobbyists today. Now some hobbyists have a good collection of all the original devices. Original power supplies um, were heavy, heavy metal boxes. To, um, that were typically called rectifiers. I actually had one of those with this piece of equipment, but it was a, a really bad rust bucket, so I didn't bother trying to recover it. Uh, other hobbyists also have the original radio equipment that might have interfaced to this directly, and antennas in their backyards, and, and really work this equipment like you should uh, with the heavy metal accessories that went with this. But then there's a number of us that don't have that luxury of that equipment, so we have to drive this with uh, modern computers. So in that case, we need some sort of way of interfacing this to more conventional, when I say conventional, I mean modern data interfaces to drive this difficult environment of this old interface. So I'm gonna do a video cut and we're gonna pull out the interface board that I'm um, referring to and we're gonna take a look and see how that works. This is version zero of the interface board, basically the prototype, but I pretty much have it like I want it now. Over here on the left, you see two quarter inch jacks. This is for taking the line jacks from the equipment. So down here is the keyboard jack. And then here is the uh, printer jack. I have these wired at my teletype, so those are completely independent loops. This allows me to have full duplex operation, which is how I normally want to work. A jumper can be installed right here and it'll run half duplex. That way anything you type is immediately echoed on your um, printer as well, if you're doing any testing or debug. Uh, over here on this side is the host interface. This is an RS-232 uh, compatible port using RJ-11. So you just plug in a phone wire here. And then on the other end of that phone wire, you just use modular DB25 or DB9 connectors. And just plug it in. And now I can hook to my vintage Altair or MSI or other old computer. Or of course for PC, you use the, the DB9 version. These are still ready, readily available um, all over the place. Um, so it makes it very easy to have these pre-wired just like you need it. Of course on a PC you might need a USB adapter and so that's typically how you end up using it on a PC. Now on the RS-232 side it always runs at 9600 baud so you do not have to worry about conversion to 45 and a half baud. It also takes care of the one and a half stop bits and all that for you of course. There is a full conversion between ASCII and uh, BOTO done. There's multiple tables installed. Right now I have the USTTY and the ITA2 tables in there and you can choose between those two um, in a monitor through the RS-232 port. The way this handles the throttling is that there's a handshake line on here that runs to your RS-232 device. And on the PC, it's just a matter of checking a checkbox on the terminal emulator you might be using, for example. Um, on a vintage computer, the CTS line is typically available with a jumper or whatever on, a, um, on the serial port coming in. And most of your older UARTs automatically throttle the CTS, so you don't have to do any hardware, excuse me, any software changes at all. It, it just works. All right, now the other connection on here is this audio jack. 
This is for connecting a AFSK data, like from ITTY or maybe from a radio. I'm not sure that it's robust enough to um, actually handle the extra noise of a radio signal, but it works great for ITTY um, as far as getting that data feed. It just decodes it and sends it straight to the printer for you. Okay, the last thing you see on here is this power jack. This is for a standard AC adapter. It's a 15 volt power jack, uh, 15 volt AC adapter. As you see, there's no high voltage uh, components on here. There's no heat sinks on here. And you need nothing else other than this board with a 15 volt supply to actually make this work. Um, the way this does this all with low voltage is when um, the selector magnet switches from one to zero, the snubber circuit captures all the voltage that is building up from the decay of the magnetic field on this capacitor. When you then need to transition from zero to one, it dumps this capacitor into the printer so that it rapidly rises. This way it does not have to have a separate 120 volt supply, does not have to have big hot resistors and heat sinks and all that kind of good stuff. And it's just this nice little board and really that's everything other than the AC adapter coming in and your connection to your devices. All right, I'm gonna go do a video cut and we'll run through a few demos of this. To begin with, I'll demonstrate half duplex operation of the board. In this situation, everything I type gets immediately echoed up onto the printer and it gets sent to the computer at the same time if you even want to use that data. Uh, down there, I've got the interface board down low now. You can see I have the power supply hooked up. That's the AC adapter and the uh, two cords for the loop. All right, so let me, uh, it's gonna be hard to get everything in here, but. So I just type, this is a test. And you can see we're just operating where it echoes everything I type right now. All right, let's go ahead and uh, hook up to the computer now. All right, now for a quick demo of the RS-232 link to a PC. I've currently got the uh, RS-232 cable plugged in from there, running over to this, well, it's a Macintosh running Windows, but I'm running TerraTerm, which is just a standard terminal emulator. Anything I type on this keyboard will go over to the teletype. Anything I type on the teletype will show up here on the screen. So let me first go ahead to the teletype and type a message. So the message I typed is, this is data from the 15. Obviously I did a figure shift over there to get the 1.5 and all that came over here properly in ASCII, just kind of like you'd expect. All right, and then anything I type over there is gonna end up coming um, out over here. I don't, you won't be able to read this until I go up there and hold a look at it. Kind of weird typing where you can't see it and then the rate at which it comes out is different. But you can see uh, this is data from the PC as I type it in and I figure shift it, well I did over there, I typed a period and numbers, obviously it came over here and figure shifted all that just as you'd expect. Alright, the other thing you can do is just send files and that'll work as well. So I've got a, an ASCII file here, a notepad with a quick brown box message in here twice. And I can just send that over to the PC. I mean, over to the teletype. Well, let's see. Where am I? Send file. And the quick message. Um, it's just pretty much automatic. It handles carriage return timing for you. If it's on a long line, it has to do carriage return and on certain nulls to make it take longer. Um, of course, that can be disabled if you don't want it in there. There's also a pass-through mode where anything that comes over 
is assumed to be a 5-bit Vado code and vice versa in the other direction. Those can be independently enabled. So what I'm gonna do here is enable that uh, pass-through mode quickly and um, go ahead and demo that. All right, now we'll go ahead and demonstrate the pass-through mode. This is where every character that is sent over from the PC, only the lower five bits are used, and those are assumed to be uh, Bado ready data to send to the printer. Likewise, you can enable it for the keyboard coming back in as too, and as well, independently. All right, so what I'm gonna send is the, uh, the Jingle Bells song that uses all the figure shifts and the bells. So I'll just do a file, send, and Jingle Bells. was a demo of the pass-through mode of the board. Now let's demonstrate receiving data from the ITTY feed from the RTTY.com site. If we go over here, we can see that website. And just click here on Internet Teletype. And then hit play. Next, I'm going to hook up and use this as a console on my uh, Altair 8800 computer. Well, this video's gotten a bit too long, so I'm going to move the demonstration with the Altair into its own separate video. And in that video, we can see what the interface board does for ASCII characters that it cannot print and for ASCII characters that can't be entered on the keyboard.